Hi, this is Misha. And um, I've been asked if I had a Tokarev, and uh, we've, we've done videos on these rifles in the past. But we've kind of been going through our back catalog and, and revisiting. So it's time for the Tokarev. Specifically, this is the SVT-40, essentially Tokarev's self-loading or semi-auto rifle of 1940, and this one was made in 1940, as it happens. <clears throat> and this is an AVT-40, well, sort of, we'll get into that in a bit, which was the select fire version of Tokarev's rifle, so automatic Tokarev rifle. This one was made in 1943. All right, there is a lot of backstory and really more than I care to do in a video today and probably you care to listen to, but it might at least pique your interest and you can research it yourself because it's a really interesting story involving Stalin and communism and all kinds of fun things. Fedor Tokarev was born in the latter part of the 19th century, 1872. So not exactly a, uh, a young man by the time of World War II, the Great Patriotic War. He became a uh, military cadet in the 1890s. And in 1896, he was um, given basically unit armor status. He had some certificates in that. He would soon go on to be granted the rank of officer, an officer's commission. And he was in, started to become interested in, um, in designing by around 1910. But of course, the First Great War, World War I began, and that put a lot of things on hold. He was an officer during that war. Now, interestingly, Russia did adopt a self-loading rifle even select fire, some might even argue a, a, an early assault rifle, in the guise of the 1916 Fedorov. However, very few were made during the war. Most of them were actually assembled after the war, after the, the Bolshevik takeover, and so on and so forth. But there was that initial impotence, and it was chambered originally for a proprietary 6.5 millimeter cartridge. However, because of the war, it ended up being rechambered for 6.5 Arasaka. We have a good bit on it in our evolution of the self-loading rifle video, if you're interested. Well, after the war, the, the, the 1916 really didn't go much of anywhere. The communists were taking more and more control. And by the 20s, they decided that they wanted to progress the bolt-action rifle, which led from the 1891 to the 19, excuse me, to the 9130 updates we would see later. They also decided to stick with the 7.62 by 54 rimmed cartridge. So what the hell does this all have to do with the, the, the SVT? Well, this meant that designers had to work under these constraints using this full power cartridge. And Tokarev was one such designer. He actually tinkered with the submachine gun briefly in the 1920s before turning his attention to self-loading rifles. There were multiple trials involving the original Fedorov, Ditrev, and even Simonov, who is the inventor of the SKS. There was really no clear winner. 1928, 1930, we had trials. 1931, a design from Simonov was very uh, promising and actually led to a small production batch at Izhesk. What Tokarev would first try would be a conversion of the Mosin Nagant, well, this didn't go anywhere, obviously. Next, he would try a, um, like a, a recoil-operated system, much like you might see on a Browning shotgun or some early other self-loaders. This did not go much of anywhere either. There would even be some small experimentation with the bang system, the gas trap system. In the end, though, he settled on the short-stroke gas piston, which we're very familiar with today. And this would be in most of his prototypes from 1934 onwards. 1935, we have a round of trials to select a new select fire 
standard issue infantry rifle. And two of the heaviest contenders were Tokarev and Semenov. Now in these trials, the Semenov would win, even being officially adopted as the AVS-36. This was a select fire gun. It used an interesting wedge locking system for the bolt, as well as a short stroke gas piston. It had a 15 round magazine. And it was liked by those in the military, at least initially. On paper, it looked good. However, it quickly wasn't. It entered into limited production in 1937 and 1938. And when it really got out in the field and got in the hands of butterfingered recruits, and not just those wearing white gloves, metaphorically speaking, it proved itself to be infinitely complicated, convoluted, had lots of small parts, it was kind of heavy, long, it just wasn't terribly reliable in the dust and the dirt and the mud and the snow and the ice and everything else. It was not a good fit for Russia. On top of that, of course, the select fire option was useless, being chambered for 7.62 by 54 rimmed. So at the strong encouragement of uh, Joseph Stalin, another round of trials were held in 1938. And this time the idea was, okay, let's ditch this full auto notion and just go to a self-loading rifle, semi-auto only. Again, Simonov would submit an updated version of his design, and Tokarev would submit what we would know today as the SVT-38. Now there was arguments for each in the military. Some said that the SVT-38 was clearly more promising, lighter, simpler. Others pointed out the fact that they'd already adopted the AVS-36, and so they already had production set up, and it would therefore be easier to improve the design and fix the faults. Semenom himself was saying he failed to find the problems and had more or less fixed them. Well, one thing, in a normal government there might be some back and forth. Stalin more or less suggested that they go with the Tokarev design. He and Tokarev were buddies. Tokarev himself was more of an insider. He was an older gentleman. Semenov was quite young at the time. So Tokarev was more of the party insider. And with Stalin's tacit support, this swayed the vote. So his rifle, not too dissimilar to this one here, but an, still an earlier version, was adopted as the SVT-38. This would go into production first at Tula in the summer of 1939. And then at Ishesk in the fall of 1939. And by this point, Tula would be at full scale production. Essentially, the, the first few months at Tula were getting up to speed and kind of getting the manufacturing down because it was a radically different design. At the same time, of course, ABS 36 production was halted. Russia claims they produced 65,000, nearly 66,000. AVS 36s. This is possible they had giant factories, but looking at their other numbers from this period, they tended to exaggerate a bit. And comparing to other numbers, this is relatively small, believe it or not, for the uh, for the Soviet Union. And also keep in mind that France produced over 85,000 1917, you know, RSC rifles. So this was pretty small, but they they had a large enough number. They didn't just immediately shit can all of the AVS 36s, they would keep them in service, even while the SVT 38 was going into production and first being issued into the field. So by November of 1939, the SVT 38 was in production at two factories, and the AVS 36 was winding down. They were producing whatever they had left using the parts. That was it. Also, Russia decided it would be an excellent idea to invade Finland, knowing what we know today is the Winter War. 
beginning in December and running through the winter of 1940. Well, good news. Since this Red Army did have a lot of AVS-36s still in inventory, a number of them were used in Finland, and they proved themselves to be crap in the ice and cold. So good, you know, they, they didn't work out well. Unfortunately, nor did the SVT-38. It also proved itself quite crap. Also in the cold, but in the hands of the Russian conscript. Now keep in mind, this was immediately after a lot of the purges that Stalin had instituted. So a lot of the, the, the knowledgeable higher-ups were gone. The military is in a pretty pathetic state at this point. But that's a story for another day. The SVT-38 was much like this SVT M40 I'm holding here. It had a slightly longer receiver, slightly longer muzzle device. It had a two-piece stock dovetailed together. It had dual barrel bands. It stored its cleaning rod on the side. It had a fixed mag catch. So on and so forth. It was designed to be lean and mean. It was designed to be lighter weight than the AVS, and it was. It was actually quite a bit lighter. It was also a little bit shorter, a couple inches shorter. And so it succeeded at that, but it just wasn't durable. They, they compromised too much, making it lightweight. So it didn't end up working out very well for them. So, here we go again. In April of 1940, SVT-38 production was ordered halted, and it took a little time for this to catch up, but they did. And Russian records claim they produced over 100,000. This, again, like I said, seems a little exaggerated, but you get the idea. At least we do see some SVT-38s. Once again, some proposed getting away from the Tokarev design and either looking at Simonov or even someone else's. But no, no, no. Um, Tokarev says he can fix the problems. And since he's Stalin's buddy, unlike Simonov, who said the same thing just a couple of years earlier, he was given that chance. Stalin stepped in again and suggested they keep on using the SVT design just with some updates. And so this is what happened. Again, later in 1940, Tula would switch over to the new pattern, this one here, known as SVT-40. Later, Irshesk would follow suit, and a third factory, Podosk, would also come online to produce these. Now, interestingly, before we get any further, Podolsk, that's the one that many people mistake for Kafrov. Kafrov never produced the SVT. They made other heavy cannons and machine guns, but they did not. That was Podolsk. Just a, a, a point of, of thing to point out there. What they basically did with the SVT-40's updates, we went to a single-piece stock, which was much stronger. We went to a shorter handguard system here have an adjustable gas system. We have a 24 and a half inch barrel firing 760-54 rimmed still. We have a kind of fish gill multi-port, eight port there, muzzle brake. Actually a very effective brake. It was made a little shorter than on the SBT-38. We have a bayonet lug here. We move the cleaning rod under the barrel as of course you see. We have pretty standard adjustable ladder rear sights. Originally we had scope rails, one on each side for mounting an optic because the idea was hopefully to turn these into marksman rifles. And these rails would actually date back to the 38. We have a short stroke gas piston running on top of the barrel here. We have a tilting bolt lug system with the last round hold open as you see. There's no release, you just kind of got to put your finger in and 
let it go. Now, one of the complaints about the 38 was that mags were getting accidentally dropped in the snow and lost. Now this had, the SVT38, like this here, has a relatively large mag catch, so I can see that, why it might happen. It was fixed, it didn't fold on that. The folding was something they introduced to kind of lock the mag in place. You'll also see this on the PPSH41. So they introduced that mag lock there, probably a good idea. We're feeding from actually quite modern styled mags. These are 10 rounds, double stack, double feed. They're made of stamped steel. They actually have a slight curve to them because of the rim. They are, as I showed, have a bolt hold open feature. Again, it's a very, actually, very good mag. That's not really a complaint you hear about these with the original mags. I know there, there are some rubbish aftermarkets out there, but the originals work pretty well. We have a pretty typical trigger. We have a very, very simple safety. It just flips behind. To physically block the trigger and then to take it off is actually quite smooth. This is still a quite a lightweight stock. The whole gun while it is long is surprisingly lightweight for its time. And yeah it does have some nice little updates from the SVT38. I wish I had a S38 to show you but the very few I've ever seen have been very, very rough condition because of where they came from. Most of them came out of Finland because they were captured during the Winter War. Well, there would be a peace treaty between Russia and Finland, 1940. And as I said, production by the end of 1940 would be underway at three arsenals. And they would be already at over 70,000 rifles produced that year. So we roll into 1941. This is being made in ever larger numbers. Initially, uh, feedback is reasonably good, better than the previous two, at least. Then the Germans invade in June with Operation Barbarossa. And everything changes for this gun and for pretty much every man, woman, child, cat, and dog in Soviet Russia. Throughout the summer 1941, the Red Army retreated in multiple places and multiple times. And during this period, hundreds of thousands of small arms were lost, including well over 100,000 SVT 38s and SVT 40s. The Germans kept pushing deeper and deeper into Soviet Russia, and things were very, very desperate by that fall, even for Moscow. So much so that of the three factories, Ishesk, Tula, Podolsk, two of them were evacuated. Tula and Podolsk were evacuated because they were just under threat from invasion. Now Tula, the production line for the SVT-40 was relocated to Magnogorsk. But the Podolsk line was essentially disassembled and never put back up. So production ended in 1941 there. Obviously it would take time for Tula, even though they were reestablishing themselves over the Ural Mountains and out of direct danger from Germans, it would take time. So they were offline. At the same time, these were proving to be still problematic, better than previous designs. However, they were not as accurate as hoped, so the whole marksman rifle concept would uh, basically quickly be abandoned. So they quit putting scopes on them. They, they were uh, really exhibiting vertical stringing was the biggest problem because of just poor stock fitment and just the gun in general wasn't well designed. It would heat up and shots would kind of go everywhere. Soldiers were still kind of beating them up. They found them harder to learn how to use than say the Mosin. Obviously a Mosin is much simpler 
and we're we're having a very big conscript army now because of the invasion. So you have you know millions of Russians being drafted in that had no previous combat experience. You trying to hand them an SVT and yeah, bad things happen. At the same time, the PPS H41 submachine gun was coming online, which was small, light, easy to train guys on, could deliver a heck of a lot of firepower at close to medium range, and was cheap to produce, at least compared to these. The SVT, on the other hand, took many more man hours and more resources to produce than say the Mosin Nagant M9130. So while originally the idea was to phase the M9130 out in favor of the SVT, in fact they were hoping to already have um, one third of all their units equipped with these really before the war it didn't happen and they were hoping to produce uh, over two million a year by 1942 obviously this never happened either. So they had big plans for the Tokarev rifle, but really none of them came to fruition because of the war and their performance and everything else. So priority was placed again on the M9130, so much so that the Ichesk factory was ordered to stop SVT-40 production at the end of 1941 and up M9130 production. So at the end of the year, we basically have no one making these rifles. And it has a Challenger and the PPSH-41. And of course Germans are getting closer and closer. So things are looking really just bleak, obviously. In that year, they would produce about a million of these. So we have a large number made. In fact, that was the bulk of SVT-40 production was in 1941. Tula would be set up again, like I said, over the Ural Mountains at Mednegorsk. And in 1942, they would manage to get the line back up and running for these. And they would produce over a quarter million, I think it was around 260 million, or excuse me, <laughs> 260,000. So they were up and running then, but they're the only factory making these. And already by 1942, the writing's on the wall. It takes some time, but it is. The sniper rifle version was discontinued that year with only about 50,000 made that came out of the factory fitted for a scope. On the other hand, in May of that year, May of 42, this rifle was introduced, the AVT-40. As I said, this was a select fire version. And the, really the difference is this. The safety could go to the third position here, allowing for full auto, which is a really bad idea. These guns were already kind of beating themselves up in semi only, so to make them fire full auto using 760-54 rimmed really shows you how desperate they were. They needed machine guns by hook or crook, however they could get them. They could not produce enough of their standard machine guns, so they were hoping to maybe make these into ad hoc machine guns since they weren't proving very well as DMRs or, or anything else. This didn't work though, of course. This gun is still as lightweight as ever. We still only have a 10 round magazine, which of course in full auto you're going to get zipped through really quickly. And there are reports of 20 round mags. I've looked quite a bit and there does not seem to be anything where 20 rounders were fielded if they were made, they were made just as prototypes only. Now there might be some 15s left over from the old days, who knows, but it seems like mostly 10 rounds were with the AVT 40s. And most guns were issued with a total of three mags, so 30 rounds ready to go. Yes, you can top these off with Mosin stripper clips, chargers, but still yet, full auto was pretty well ineffective. So much so that very soon, use of the feature was pretty much prohibited. Soldiers were only allowed to use the option when a commanding officer told them to. And that leads us in to a good segue here to kind of compare some differences, some changes that happened to the design throughout late 41 and 42, really to simplify and streamline for mass production and wartime expediencies. Let's start with the most obvious. We originally have this very nice 
muzzle brake. It was actually very effective, but it was also quite time consuming to the machine. So in late 1941, approval was given to switch to this much more simplified four port design. It's still effective, but you know, only about 60% is so. So nearly half as effective at controlling muzzle. And keep in mind, these were pretty much all on the AV T40s, which means in full auto, they were crazy. <laughs> Another early change, they would go from an eight to a seven hole upper shroud here. Just to streamline production a bit. Moving back, in 42, we would go from bolts left in the white to bolts being blued. Now, since this is a refurb, that doesn't really apply here, but you get the idea. They changed the finish on the bolt. Bluing was faster and easier. Now, when I say in the white, I don't mean the metal was untreated. Of course, it was chemically treated, but they went to blued bolts in 42. They also removed the scope rail here. in late 41 when they realized that they weren't actually going to be putting scopes on these critters. They would go to, this is the original thin trigger guard, you probably won't see it on camera, but they went to a fatter, chunkier trigger guard. This was a little more durable, obviously it also saved time with machining. We went from having a lightning cut in the rear sight. To leaving that machining step off here. One more little simplification. We would also go to a thicker, heavier stock at the wrist in 1942. This one's, like I said, quite thin. This one's noticeably thicker. A lot of people think of these as AVT 40 stocks, and while they did appear on a lot of the AVT guns, this is really just a beefier stock introduced to try to make accuracy a little better for a better fit, and also just durability. These things like to crack in this wrist from recoil. We would also simplify the front sling swivel. This uses a true swivel here, two piece as it's called. This uses a single piece swivel fixed bar. They would do a little simplification work to this lower shroud too in 1942, 1943, that time period. And really one of the last changes that I can't show you, they would, um, in 1944, they would go away from the rear sling swivel to a stock slot like you would see on a Mosin. So they would further simplify that. Those are pretty uh, pretty common on refurbs because it seems like a lot of those stocks are made late in production and never used. So when they refurb to guns, they would um, install them. But originally, they would actually not have many guns coming from the factory with those stocks. And of course, the magazines themselves would get simplified. The finish would get rougher, machining coarser, markings more sporadic. They would just simplify the 10 round mag. Again, wartime expediencies. You know, and then of course there's just that general rough machining of 1942, 1943 guns that you would see on Mosins. And there's other several small changes, of course. Uh, it's not even nearly all of them, guys, but that gives you at least an idea of the different little variations you can find. By 1943, this gun's days were numbered. It was still in production at Tula, but they were producing Mosins, they were producing various other equipment for the uh, Red Army, and even a new round of trials was going on, or at least a beginning to go. This would result in the SKS, which was another Simonov design, and eventually long term would lead to the AK-47, the AK Kalashnikov. So even by the middle of the war they knew this thing was pretty well over. So in 43, 44, they would still produce these at Tula, but numbers would get lower and lower, and they would finally shut down the entire line in January of 45. So they didn't even wait to the end of the war. Although, of course, in that in that month, the war was um, it was ending. It was just a matter of time and the, the body count. In total, Russia would produce about 100 
million six hundred thousand SVTs. So a very, very far cry from their original goals and, and aspirations. The AVT itself obviously didn't go much of anywhere. They quickly pulled these out of production by 1943 and most AVTs were turned back into SVT-40s, including this one here. So while it still has its selector, all the go-fast parts are gone inside. So it still just fires semi-only. That's why this is what it is. It was originally manufactured as such, but then converted back when they realized what a, just a, a, a really, really bad idea it was. And that's pretty much this gun's history. You know, for as much development time and energy that went into it, it just, it never really lived up to promise. It was too conservative, it was firing a too heavy cartridge. And that's really what convinced them to finally switch over to 7.62, originally 41 and later 39, the intermediate caliber cartridge, which the SKS and the RPD would be among the first to be chambered for, and then soon the AK would join the ranks. This was actually a very decent gun for what it was. It just wasn't decent for Russia. Germans who acquired these during the war really enjoyed them. In fact, they gave them a name and designation and even printed manuals for their soldiers to use. Because remember, in 1941, while this may not have been the best self-loading rifle on the planet, it was better than what the Germans had, which was effectively none. The, uh, the G41 wasn't out yet. So... This was better than a Mauser, and it was actually very good. I could even say some things that it has over the M1 Garand. I think its um, style of short stroke gas piston is better. Its tilting bolt is very effective. Its charging system and magazine and all that are definitely superior. When we have a detachable, very modern style 10 round mag, we have a very effective muzzle brake. If it were just a little stronger, and also maybe issued to more of a professional military. For example, Finland would capture about 4,000 SVT-38s during the Winter War, and then in another additional 15,000 SVT-40s and SVT-38s during the so-called Continuation War. So they would have nearly 20,000 of these, and they would reissue them in their military, and uh, you know, be quite effective. It wasn't their favorite gun, but it worked a lot better for them than it did in the Russians because they maintained them. Well, in Russia, the SVTs were pulled out of service after World War II. And then they were officially de retired and declared obsolete in 1955. They were put into long-term storage for a kind of just-in-case scenario. And like this rifle here, like the Mosins and the SKSs we mostly received, they were refurbished and then put into storage. And that's where this one, this one came from. This was a 90s import. Not many nations outside of Russia adopted or issued these guns. First off, no one manufactured them. These were only ever made in Russia, most at Tula. Obviously, I said Finland used them. A few others would be given away to communist allies, such as this gun here. These are often called Bulgarian light refurbs because they did not go through the Russian refurbishment program. They went through someone else's. Even the non-refurbs we get, they were actually refurbed because they came out of Finland. Inner Arms brought over about 7,500, give or take, in the late 50s and early 60s. Now, they don't have the Russian telltale refurb signs, so people often think they haven't been touched, but most SVT-40s we get have had something done to them. There are a handful of honest-to-God bringbacks, of course, but yeah. So a lot of the ones that survived the war ended up here. Some are still in Russia, of course, but they really didn't go anywhere after World War II because this was clearly an inferior design. It was outclassed by the SKS, which itself was very quickly rendered obsolete by the AK. So it was just in that rapid period of development and was frankly soon forgotten. And that's probably why a lot of folks, when they think of Tokarev, they think of the pistol. Very few really think of these rifles here, even though they did see 
a significant amount of service in World War II. And they were produced, you know, over a million and a half. So, not an insignificant number. And it was a very good self-loading rifle for its day and time. It just had a few intrinsic flaws, some of them its fault, and some of them the fault of just its user, Soviet Russia. But frankly, if Tokarev had not been pals with Stalin, who knows what would have happened. The thing could have gone very differently if he had favored Simonov back in the 30s. Well, Tokarev himself would actually live on. He would finally die in 1968. He had a ripe, nice, long life. He was decorated many times by the Soviet Union and uh, had a reasonably successful career. He was a career military officer. So it's well worth honoring his contribution. He definitely put a lot of time and energy and probably love into this rifle. And Russia was very forward thinking in the 1930s. I mean, good grief, they even wanted to leapfrog over self-loading and go straight to uh, select fire in the beginning. I mean, this is at a time long before America had adopted the Grand or anyone else. So this is why Russia was really one of the first I mean, the, the, S, the AV, excuse me, the AVS really predates the grant. It just wasn't successful, so we don't really think of it. So they weren't exactly backward thinking in all ways. There were a few other variations. For example, there was a carbine version with an 18-inch barrel, but this seems to have just been a prototype. There were a few in the USA, but people are unsure if they were fakes or battlefield um, expedient creations or, or what. But that was really about it. Tokarev did submit a design in 1944 to the trials that Simonov would ultimately win with the SKS, but by that point, the SVT-38 and SVT-40 both kind of failing. It was a, it was, yeah, it wasn't going to win. The Simonov was finally getting recognition, and his own star would rise in Russia for a time with his gun going into production after the war, and actually the SKS being much more popular outside of Russia than it ever was within. But that is a story for another day. Well, you asked for a, you know, history and whatnot of the SVT. You can wake up now. Hope you enjoyed it. We do have some shooting clips and other videos. I'll see if I can dig those up for this one and add them in. I don't know if we can, though, because we've got some old videos that are gone. But um, that's the gun that most people kind of forget from World War II. Well, I'm tired of talking. <laughs> If you like the video, I'd appreciate it if you click like, and we'd love to hear your comments below. And if you'd like to help support us, please check out the link to our Patreon page. This is Misha. And I'll catch you next time.